To most everyone, each decision of public policy should simply be decided on its own merits, with regard for what seems best for the common good of our country, instead of every issue being exploited for either political or economic advantage. Coincidentally, this public spiritedness is the exact same hope expressed by America's founders. In authoring Federalist 10, James Madison expressed the founders' observation regarding the corrosive effect partisanship had on society. Complaints are everywhere heard that our governments are too unstable, that the public good is disregarded in the conflicts of rival parties, and that measures are too often decided not according to the rules of justice. Among the numerous advantages promised by a well-constructed union, none deserves to be more accurately developed than its tendency to break and control the violence of faction. By a faction, I understand a number of citizens who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. A zeal for different opinions concerning religion, concerning government, and attachment to different leaders ambitiously contending for preeminence and power have, in turn, divided mankind into parties, inflamed them with mutual animosity, and rendered them much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for their common good. Although our founders had nothing but disdain for faction and hoped it would not stain the new American nation of their creation, they were not able to rise above partisanship themselves. Nevertheless, they caught a glimpse of what could be, and within that glimpse, the founders were unanimously opposed to partisanship and political parties or factions. George Washington perhaps best expressed the anti-party sentiment when writing in his farewell address about the ill effect to the democratic principle from what today we know as minority lobbying for preferential favors. A government for the whole is indispensable. No alliances between the parts can be an adequate substitute. All obstructions to the execution of the laws all combinations and associations, under whatever plausible character, with the real design to direct, control, counteract, or awe the regular deliberation and action of the constituted authorities, are destructive of this fundamental principle and of fatal tendency. They serve to organize faction, to give it an artificial and extraordinary force, to put in the place of the delegated will of the nation, the will of a party, often a small but artful and enterprising minority of the community, and to make the public administration the mirror of the ill-concerted and incongruous projects of faction, rather than the organ of consistent and wholesome plans digested by common councils and modified by mutual interests. The two major parties do not work for the whole or the common good. They are instead, as President Washington understood, alliances of parts, economic interests, political activists, and politicians ambitious for power. These two organized factions, the Republican and Democratic parties, are, as President Washington aptly described, artful and enterprising minorities. Together they comprise, in effect, an elite political caste whose motives are far removed from the common interests of ordinary Americans and equally as far removed from the noble vision of enlightened governance upon which America's founding promised. Our national capital has not only degenerated into the largest collection of factions in all of history, but collectively these factions have become their own special interest. Our national capital has evolved into a cesspool of money and power. Washington continued with a short description 
about the questionable character of those who would control the government should parties establish themselves. However combinations or associations of the above description may now and then answer popular ends, they are likely, in the course of time and things, to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government, destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. President Washington could have been speaking about our own time and the politicians of our own day. He implored his fellow citizens not to degenerate into the spirit of party, even offering a brief list of what would await the country if it did select leaders through parties. Let me warn you in the most solemn manner against the baneful effects of the spirit of party. The common and continual mischiefs of the spirit of party are sufficient to make it the interest and duty of a wise people to discourage and restrain it. It serves always to distract the public councils and enfeeble the public administration. It agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms, kindles the animosity of one part against another, forments occasionally riot and insurrection. It opens the door to foreign influence and corruption, which find a facilitated access to the government itself through the channels of party passions. Are we not experiencing what President Washington foresaw and warned us about, especially when each party hopes to boost its votes by fanning the flames of partisan passion among its core supporters? The spirit of party, agitating the community, kindling animosity between us, opening the door to foreign influence and corruption, the existence of political parties is far beneath the noble vision of our founders. John Adams, seceding Washington to the presidency, was equally opposed to the spirit of party or partisanship. Author David McCullough, in his biography of John Adams, writes that, like Washington and many others, Adams had become increasingly distraught over the rise of political divisiveness, the forming of parties or factions that political parties were an evil that could bring the ruination of Republican government was doctrine he, with others, had long accepted and espoused. There is nothing I dread so much as a division of the Republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader and converting measures in opposition to each other. The turbulent maneuvers of factions could tie the hands and destroy the influence of every honest man with a desire to serve the public good. There was division of sentiments over everything. Two great parties destroying the influence of every honest person with a desire to serve the public good. Have we not all sadly observed that the best people are not representing us? that honest people probably cannot survive our political system? Adams's observation that parties would lead to a division of sentiments over everything certainly rings true about politics today. Yet the endless partisan bickering that we have grown so weary of cannot be put aside in our two-party system because the success of one political party is based on the perceived failure of the other. Policies made for the common good and that would genuinely benefit ordinary Americans cannot emerge within our contemporary two-party system. To those of the revolutionary generation, historian Joseph J. Ellis has written, giving one's allegiance to a political party was illegitimate. It violated the core of virtue and disinterestedness presumed essential for anyone properly equipped to oversee public affairs. 
the role of party leader was not just unbecoming, but utterly incompatible with his responsibilities as president, which were to transcend party squabbles and reach decisions like a patriot king whose sole concern was the long-term public interest. In the spirit of that judgment, John Adams cast disparagement on those who would sell their talents to become a shill or propagandist for a party. The favorites of parties, although they have always some virtues, have always many imperfections. Many of the ablest tongues and pens have, in every age, been employed in the foolish, deluded, and pernicious flattery of one set of partisans, and in furious, prostitute invectives against another. But such kinds of oratory never had any charms for me, and if I must do one or the other, I would quarrel with both parties and with every individual of each before I would subjugate my understanding or prostitute my tongue or pen to either. Thomas Jefferson concurred with Adams, having written in a letter to Francis Hopkinson on March 13, 1789, I never submitted the whole system of my opinions to the creed of any party of men whatever. If I could not go to heaven but with a party, I would not go there at all. Those of us who desire the common good to be placed as the paramount objective of government policy must also quarrel with both parties and with every individual of each. The Republican and Democratic parties manifest the very factionalism Washington and Adams warned against. Neither party is interested in submitting to Thomas Jefferson's dictum to follow truth wherever it may lead. Those of us who continue to be staunch supporters of one of the parties need to advance beyond party identification and become independent populists. Those of us who continue to judge political issues through the filter of ideology need to progress beyond conservatism or liberalism and become independent thinkers. Both political party and ideology act like an anesthetic to one's reason, insightfully described as the deep slumber of a decided opinion. Writing to his friend Benjamin Rush on February 6, 1805, Adams wondered, is virtue the principle of our government? Is honor? Or is ambition and avarice, adulation, baseness, covetousness, the thirst for riches, indifference concerning the means of rising and enriching, the contempt of principle, the spirit of party and of faction, the motive and principle that governs. In another letter, Adams summarized the foremost problem we must grapple with today when he wrote, How few aim at the good of the whole. How ironic Adams' words are, where today it has become laughable to think of the political process as a rational search for social remedies, since almost everyone in politics exploits social problems for their own perceived benefit, without a thought for what might be best for society. As long as the two political parties control our political system, it is unrealistic to expect government to legislate policies in the interests of the common good and that favor the broad American populace. By reviewing the thought of some of the founders, we can confidently know that none of us are silly in our hope for a responsible government where politics is a rational search for the solution to national and social problems, but a responsible government that leaves no American behind can never come about if we divide ourselves into factions.